Okay, my name is Carolyn Harris, and it is my very great pleasure to introduce the Reverend Dr. Stephen Sizer today. Dr. Sizer is a retired priest in the Church of England and has served a number of congregations over the last 34 years. He has written a number of books on Christian Zionism. Two of them include Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon, and Zion's Christian Soldiers, the Bible, Israel, and the Church. He is the founder and director of the nonprofit Peacemaker Trust that works with persecuted minorities and those who are denied human rights. He serves on the board of Sabil Kairos UK and the Living Stones of the Holy Land Trust. Now, Dr. Sizer holds degrees from Sussex University, Oxford University, and a PhD from Oak Hill College and Middlesex University. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Sizer. Thank you, Dr. Sizer, for being with us today. Thank you. I hope I can show my slide screen, my, my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint or is it just me seeing it? Uh, Stephen, I think you're going to have to hit share screen and then uh, share screen. add. How do I do that? Share screen. At the bottom, there should be a the green button, button that says yep. share screen. Yep. And then choose the screen you want to. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to be with you today. And um, can you see my screen now? Yes, you can. Yes. Good. Uh, it's a delight to be with you and uh, and to be able to contribute uh, alongside Muntha and Jonathan uh, in your webinar on this very important subject, Christian support for the state of Israel. Is it biblical? Well, I hope that at the end of by the end of today, uh, it will be crystal clear whether it is or is not biblical. Um, just think about reflect upon that Christian support for the United States is it biblical Christian support for the United Kingdom is it biblical it it takes on a different connotation um, another alternative would be Christian support for the apartheid state of Israel um, is it biblical that perhaps begins to um, uh, be a more accurate way of describing this question. But the way I'm going to handle it in the time I have is to um, look at the question from the point of view of uh, Christians who believe it is uh, our responsibility to support the state of Israel, as Jonathan has said, people who identif self-identify as Christian Zionists. Um, and I'm going to look at five of the popular um, assumptions they make from scripture uh, by which they defend their support for the state of Israel. Um, and we're going to look at five of them briefly, and then I'm going to deconstruct them again from the scriptures. Uh, the first is that they believe that God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel. Um, secondly, they believe that the Jewish people are God's chosen people. Thirdly, that the promised land was given to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. Fourthly, that uh, Jerusalem is the exclusive and undivided eternal capital of the Jewish people. And fifthly, that God has a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. And it's for these reasons that Christians should support the state of Israel. And we're going to look at these one at a time and see what the scriptures actually say. Now, I liken uh, this theology to a balloon, a balloon of hot air, because as you begin to read the scriptures and see the context of the uh, claims made by Christian Zionists, you realize that it is nothing more than a balloon of hot air. And I like to say, how many pins do you need to burst a balloon? But one is enough. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to give you five. And they're based on my book, Zion's Christian Soldiers. And uh, you can access the book from my website or from Kindle, 
or if you want an outline of this presentation I'm giving today, go to my website, stephensizer.com. The first um, item today, at least, is a promotion of today's webinar. And if you scroll down on the, on the screen, you'll find a link to this um, uh, PDF, which looks at 10 of the common assumptions made by Christian Zionists. But we're going to look at five of them most pertinent to our theme uh, today. So let's begin with the first. God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel. This is a popular assumption based on a promise God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I will make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, the first assumption is based on a misreading, because you must note that the promise was made to Abraham and no one else. Second, there is nothing in the text to indicate God intended the promise to apply to Abraham's physical descendants in unconditionally or in perpetuity. The promise is uh, developed in Genesis 22 when God says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, and through your seed all nations on earth will be blessed. Christian Zionists would say Israel is the seed and the world is blessed um, as, uh, as we recognize God's purposes for Israel today. A very important principle of hermeneutics, that is uh, interpretation of scripture, is to allow scripture to interpret scripture. And on this issue, uh, the scriptures are unambiguous and clear because the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter three explicitly refers to this promise God made to Abraham and helps us understand how it should be applied. Notice he says, chapter three, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Jesus is the seed, not Israel. And those who recognize Jesus and follow him are the inheritors of the promises God made to Abraham. Do you see how one verse or rather two or three verses from Galatians 3 has done what? It's burst a balloon on that issue. The way that we read scripture must be through the eyes of Jesus. Uh, we find that the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. And, uh, and it's very important that we read the Old Testament through the grid of the new, not the other way around. Uh, in John 5, for example, Jesus says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, meaning the Old Testament is about Jesus, not about Israel. And then uh, on the road to Emmaus, when he's um, uh, in, engaging with these two disciples, uh, he says to them, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So God's purposes, God's blessing and God's curses relate to how we respond to Jesus, not how we respond to Israel, least of all, how we respond to a secular state today. So the balloon, well, we've burst it. But let's look at a second premise which Christian Zionists make, and that is that the Jewish people are God's chosen people. And the implication is that they are today his chosen people, and that's why we should support the state of Israel. What we find, however, in the Old Testament is that God's purposes have been to draw together a people that are and were and are inclusive on the basis of faith, not race. I'll just give you a few examples. Deuteronomy chapter 23. God says, don't despise an Edomite. For the Edomites are related to you. Don't despise an Egyptian because you resided as foreigners in their country. The third generation of children born to them may enter 
the assembly of the Lord. They may enter the people of God. And um, God's will has always been, God's, God's people have always been uh, open to all races on the basis of grace and faith, not race. And it's in Isaiah 56 that we see the Lord anticipate and repudiate the rise of an exclusive Israeli nationalism, the very kind of nationalism we see today in Zionism and uh, in the policies of the Israeli government toward the Palestinians. Notice what God says through the prophet Isaiah. Let no foreigners who bound themselves to the Lord say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, who hold fast to his covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Now, just think about it. Why would, uh, why would foreigners say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people when the Lord says, don't say it? Why would they say it when the Lord has told them not to say it? Presumably because the Lord's people were doing the excluding. That's why Jesus, um, to go back to that, that's why Jesus cites this passage uh, when he uh, expels the money changers and the traders from the court of the Gentiles in the temple because they were impeding the invitation to the Gentiles to join uh, in God's people in the temple. But if you want one verse that, uh, that, that bursts this balloon, here it is. Esther 8, verse 17, at the end of the story of Esther, when God has delivered his people from their enemies, what happens? Uh, in every province, in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Think about that. The time of Esther Many people of other nationalities. How many is that? Well, it's a lot of people, a lot of other nationalities surrounding um, uh, where the Jews were living at the time, recognized that God was doing something and they wanted in. So from the time of Esther, the term Jew could not possibly be equated with those who could trace their physical descent back to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and Joseph. When we come to the New Testament, we find this same emphasis on the inclusivity of God's people. And we find in Matthew 8 how the Gentiles are chosen. Uh, Jesus says, I say to you, many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom, those who've rejected me, will be thrown outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The book of Romans is fascinating. People, uh, Zionists often say, oh, but what about Romans 9 to 11? And I say, well, you've got to go back and see how the terms for Jew and Israel are defined in Romans. And so in Romans 2, we find the Apostle Paul saying a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, circumcision of the heart by the spirit. So when we use the word Jew to define a Jew in, in theological terms, using the New Testament as our foundation, we see that Jewishness is spiritual, not physical. And when we get to Romans 9, we find the same thing applied to the term Israel. The apostle says it's not through God's word had failed for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants. Are they all Abraham's children? On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it's not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Do you see what he's doing there? He's saying that, we, that Israel is being pruned down. It's nothing to do with physical descent. It's on the basis of grace 
and faith, not race and works. And Paul reinforces this in his letter to uh, the Colossians. He says, here there is no Jew, Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, as Colossians, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. See, these were Jews and Gentiles. They were barbarians, they were Scythians, they were slaves, they were free. It was an inclusive chosenness. So the balloon, we've burst it. The third premise which Christian Zionists make to defend why we should support the state of Israel is the belief that the promised land was given by God to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. Well, let's see what the scriptures actually have to say about this. Contrary to popular assumption, the scriptures repeatedly insist that the promises God made to Abraham, and here's one of the examples, Genesis 15, God uh, promised Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. And uh, the early Zionists understood that to be uh, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates, right across to Iraq. Uh, and that's apparently why the Zionists were not impressed when uh, the British government gave, uh, gave uh, uh, Jordan away. Um, they saw it as part of their territory too. But what the scriptures actually teach is that the land belongs to God, not to Israel. Leviticus, for example, says the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Now, just remember that term, foreigners and strangers, because we're going to come back to that in a moment. But the emphasis in scripture is that the land belongs to God. The whole earth is his. He created it. The problem is that if we take um, your house or my house, the Zionists believe that God had given them freehold. Now, I don't know how it is in the States, but in the UK, freehold means that you're buying a house and you're buying the land under the house. It's yours. And that's what Zionists think they've got. They've got the freehold title to the land. What the Bible actually says is they've got leasehold. They get to live in God's land. They get to build their, their houses in his land, but he still owns the land, which is why he can kick them out if they rebel against him, as he did. Residence in the land in the Hebrew scriptures was always conditional. This is a, a quote from Ezekiel 33. Again, notice how um, the Lord anticipates the arrogance of nationalism, the supremacism that we see endemic in Israel today. Son of man, uh, the people living in the ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he possessed the land. We are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. You see, might is right. That's the, that's the, political theology of contemporary Christian Zionism, might is right. We beat the Arabs in 1948, we beat them in 67, therefore God is clearly giving us this land. But that's not what Ezekiel says. He says, therefore, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it, you look to your idols and shed blood, should you possess the land? You rely on your sword, you do detestable things, should you then possess the land? No, I will make the land a desolate waste and your proud strength will come to an end. Residence in the land was always conditional. But it was also an inheritance that was to be shared. God kicked out uh, the Israelites from the land and then when they repented in exile, he allowed them to return. But in Ezekiel uh, 47, God explicitly tells them the terms under which they can return to the land. He says, you are to distribute this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. You are to lot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the foreigners residing among you. 
and who have children. You are to consider them as native-born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe a foreigner resides there, you are to give them their inheritance. Now notice, when God says something once in scripture, it's true. When God says something twice in two verses, it must be important. You know, verily, verily, I say unto you. But why would God have to say the same thing three times in three verses? Share the inheritance, share the inheritance, share the inheritance. Why would he have to say it three times? Because they did not want to share the inheritance. They wanted an exclusive claim to the land. Ezekiel says, no way. When we come to the New Testament theology of land, it takes on a different perspective. We see that the land was only ever temporary. This is Hebrews 11. We come back to that term, aliens and strangers. The writer to Hebrews says this, by faith, Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. They were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what was promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. See, the notion that the land was an everlasting inheritance is, is blasphemy. The land was only ever intended to be a temporary residence place. God's people were given the leasehold, not the freehold. They were there on on unconditional on, on terms with the purpose of leading them to heaven, to leading them to the new heaven and the new earth, to the recognition that their home, as Abraham recognized, was not in the land of Canaan. The balloon, we've burst that one too. The fourth, what about Jerusalem? You often hear Zionists say Jerusalem is the exclusive and undivided eternal capital of the Jewish people. And that's why they emphasis on moving uh, embassies back to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. What do we make of this, uh, uh, this assertion? Well, this assertion has no basis whatsoever in scripture. I'll give you one example. Psalm 87. Psalm 87, God emphasizes that Jerusalem was to be a shared city. He says, I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me. Philistia too and Tyre along with Cush and will say, this one was born in Zion. Indeed of Zion, it will be said, this one and was born in her. The most high himself will establish her. The Lord will write on the register of the peoples, this one was born in Zion. Nation specifically mentioned here would include the Egyptians, Iraqis, Lebanese, even the hated Philistines are uh, mentioned as born in Zion. When you are born somewhere, what do you get? Well, in most of the world, you get citizenship, you get a passport. Think about that. And why does God have to say the same thing three times in three verses? The foreigners, are born in Zion. It's on the basis of their recognition of the one true God, their faith in God, their trust in him, their desire to follow him, gives them citizenship of Zion. Three times, three verses. Why does he have to say it that many times? Because they didn't want to share the city. Again, when we look at the New Testament, the eyes are off the old city of Jerusalem that has now served its purpose. When uh, the Lord in Matthew 28, the end of all of the gospels, sends the disciples out from Jerusalem, it is an exodus. They're never told to come back. In Acts chapter 6, when a great persecution breaks out in Jerusalem, uh, where are the apostles? They're still in Jerusalem, and he has to kick them out through persecution. The, the, the Jerusalem that the New Testament focuses on is the New Jerusalem. 
And it's not something in the future, it's something now. Hebrews 12 says, you have come, past tense, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Because when we come to faith in Jesus, we have citizenship in heaven from that moment. Revelation 21, I saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. You see, the emphasis is upon God's purposes and God's plan for the future. It's not about a physical city called Jerusalem, and least of all, a city that is a capital, an exclusive capital of one uh, uh, ethnic group. Again, the balloon, we've burst it. And finally, the fifth element of this theology that that uh, requires Christians and, 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 and pressures Christians to support the state of Israel is based on the idea that God has a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. Now, this goes back to the theology of what's called dispensationalism uh, through the writings of Cyrus Schofield and uh, Edward Irving and John Nelson Darby. Um, and D.L. Moody picked up, picked up this theology, and we won't go there now. <clears throat> but my question to you is simply this. Does God have one people or two? One people or two? It's as simple as that. What we find in the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, as we've already seen, is that God has an inclusive people made up of all nations. And what I've done in this, this is meant to be a, an image of a vine, or an olive tree, because I've, I've fused John chapter 15 and Romans 11, the, the vine of John 15 and the olive tree of Romans 11. And uh, 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 from Romans 11, for example, we know that you have natural branches, Israel, and wild olive branches, which are the Gentiles. Uh, but what it says in Romans 11, and Paul is writing to the Gentiles in Rome, he says, you Though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in nourishing sap of the olive root. Well, if Gentiles have been grafted in, into what have we been grafted? We've been grafted in to the one people of God on the basis of faith, not race. And you only have to go back to John 15 and remember the warning Jesus made about the criteria upon which people can abide in the vine, in Jesus. It's on the basis of faith, not works, not race. And, and again, Romans picks this up and says that natural branches that have rejected Christ have been broken off. And those Gentiles who uh, who've recognized Jesus, have been grafted in alongside believing Jews into the one people of God. And this is uh, reinforced and emphasized in uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where he says, he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. That's making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. One people of God out of the two, Jews and Gentiles into the one people of God. I use this hourglass or egg timer as a way of summarizing uh, the biblical revelation from the promises of Abraham right through to revelation and the great multitude around the throne of every language, tribe and nation. The pruning of God's people in the Old Testament, the remnant of Judah, the remnant of exiles, leads us to the coming of Jesus. And when Christ died on the cross, I believe Jesus was Israel. Israel was down to one person. He was the seed. Uh, Isaiah 53, what does it say? We all like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
when Christ died on the cross, how large was the faithful remnant? Well, there were three people at the cross. There was, uh, there was uh, John, M Mary, and uh, Jesus' mother, Mary. Uh, but what were they doing? They were weeping. They were not singing, when I survey the wondrous cross. They weren't rejoicing. They didn't understand. They were still under the cloud. It was only Jesus who was Israel at that point. The pruning had come down to one man, to one person. And then in his resurrection and in his restoring of his apostles uh, and the day of Pentecost and subsequently, the remnant grows to encompass uh, people of every nationality, tribe and nation and language who recognize him. So if you like, the promises made to Abraham are filtered through Jesus and reach out to all in the world who will recognize God's purposes. The one inclusive people of God. And this is reinforced again in Ephesians chapter three. The Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body. You see, dispensationalism teaches that the church is a parenthesis to God's continuing plan for Israel, plan B. That's heresy. The church is plan A. The church made up of all nations is God's purpose on earth. So does God have a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church? No, we've burst that one. To sum up, this is one way to understand uh, these, uh, how we've deconstructed these five premises of, of Christian Zionism. Um, what is the relationship between Israel and the church? What is uh, our answer uh, to this question? Uh, should we support the state of Israel? Our Zionist friends will take selected verses of scripture to emphasize uh, their case. And I call them the exclusive promises. Um, I give you this land as an everlasting inheritance, for example. And I liken that to a can of Sprite. But we've, I've shown you that um, those promises are conditional. There are clauses attached. And when you have um, conditional clauses, it changes the nature of the unconditional promises. And so since we're thinking particularly about the relationship between Israel and church, if the sprite um, uh, uh, illustrates uh, the those of a physical descent from Abraham who were claiming the land, claiming Jerusalem, claiming exclusive uh, right uh, to the land. If we've invited and, and allowed Gentiles into the people of God, as we saw from Esther, as we've seen from the other passages, if you add Coke to Sprite, what happens? What happens if you add just a little bit of Coke to Sprite? I've added some ice there as well, but it changes color. And when you've done that, you cannot go back to Sprite. The color is changed irreversibly. And that's what's happening uh, in scripture from Genesis through to Revelation. The exclusive promises are interpreted through the, uh, through the grid of Jesus and God's purposes that are revealed in and through him for all nations. So these are the five premises that we've looked at very briefly uh, today uh, that uh, our Christian Zionist friends will use to justify a biblical basis for why we should support the state of Israel. And I hope I've convinced you from just the few verses we've looked at that, uh, that this, case, this position is untenable. Christian support for the apartheid state of Israel, is it biblical? Of course not. And uh, if you want to study this uh, subject in more detail, go to my website. You can access this uh, very readable four page outline, um, which looks at the passages we've looked at this afternoon or this morning, afternoon or evening. Um, they're based on my book. You can access uh, everything in the book uh, from my website. And uh, it's on Kindle as well, if you want uh, a digital version. And my earlier book, which um, Caroline referred to 
uh, looks at the historical roots of this movement and in particular its political agenda today. Uh, and that was that was the basis of my uh, my doctoral research. But if you want to find out what what I'm actually doing uh, at the moment, um, you can go to peacemakers.ngo. It's the charity that we founded when I retired from the Church of England. Uh, in engaging uh, and, and advocating and supporting minorities where they're persecuted, where justice is denied, human rights are suppressed, or reconciliation is needed. And uh, if I'm allowed to give one plug for another event coming up soon, um, uh, we, we've created a new alliance of uh, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and it's called the Convivencia Alliance. And we're holding a, a, a webinar in October, 25th of October, with some distinguished speakers looking at how Jews, Muslims and Christians can work together to bring about a, a resolution of the conflict uh, within Israel, Palestine. So if you want to know more about that, uh, please check out the website as well. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Sizer. My name is Randy Hein Lamb and I am one of the co-chairs of the LA Orange County chapter of Friends of Seville North America. And I'm going to be leading our Q&A time here. We're actually, believe it or not, a little ahead of our schedule, um, but uh, that just gives us a few more minutes maybe for some questions here. Uh, I do have a few questions that I've received in the chat already, and I do encourage people to put other questions uh, that they may have there. And uh, I'll try to get to as many as I possibly can. One question that I know that you've dealt with in the past, and one that is a growing concern for Christians and Muslims, as well as for uh, peace-seeking uh, Jewish people in the Middle East, is the question of whether or not the uh, temple needs to be rebuilt. And I know you didn't really address that in today's discussion, but I was wondering if you would offer uh, your opinion or some biblical uh, references that would help people understand that question. Thank you, Randall. Yes, um, if, you, if you go to the outline, um, which is available on my website, um, uh, you'll find there's a section on the temple. Um, it's based on math, Matthew 24, uh, which suggests that the temple must be built and de uh, desecrated once more before Jesus returns. Um, there's absolutely nothing in the New Testament or elsewhere in scripture that suggests that a future temple is predicted, let alone mandated, just the reverse. The temple was uh, declared redundant the moment Jesus died on the cross. Uh, and the giant curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. Um, we know from John chapter two, uh, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. Um, I used to think that when Jesus entered the temple to kick out the money changers, he was cleansing it. I don't believe he was cleansing it. He was declaring it redundant because the true temple had come. Uh, the New Testament emphasizes that uh, yes, there is a new temple, and it is under construction, but it's made of people, not bricks. Uh, Ephesians 2 says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of the household, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. So the New Testament emphasizes that the, the old temple was redundant because the new temple had come, that's Jesus. And as we, uh, as we have faith in him, we are being built into the temple of the Lord. Um, that's why the Holy Spirit indwells us to make us holy. We don't need to go somewhere to worship God. Um, so the whole, the whole notion that the Jewish temple is gonna be rebuilt uh, is a complete and utter distraction. And, um, and uh, you know, we could go into a lot more detail and speculate oh, if, if and when it is built, what's it going to be used for? Well, it's not going to be a tourist attraction. It's going to be there for, for offering sacrifices. Uh, and, 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 and that must, you know, Hebrews emphasizes 
that they are re-crucifying Christ again. That uh, the, the, sacri- the, the offering of sacrifices in the temple, Hebrews emphasizes, uh, was a complete waste of time because Jesus had come. You're muted, Randall, sorry. Sorry about that. I didn't want to jump in on you early. <laughs> you um, can jump in. <laughs> in the Torah, uh, the portion of the Old Testament, uh, when Israel sinned, uh, they were punished by God. This is a question from Jim. Uh, he asks, why is there no accountability to divine basics for Israel today? It's deeply problematic when we try and interpret contemporary events in the light of scripture. Um, um, Typically, every generation suffers from chronological snobbery. We believe that our generation is the most important one and that, you know, God is doing his his will and work in our generation. Um, I I think that the, the... to answer the question, I'm, I'm, I'd be nervous to uh, sensitive about um, speculating about suffering and judgment and so on. Um, I, I am just so grateful in my own personal life that the God, you know, the Lord hasn't struck me down every time I've done things that are wrong and I've done some things that were wrong. Um, um, but his patience and forbearance is such that he wants all people to repent and come to a knowledge of the truth. And I think that um, what we are doing through Sabeel and Kairos and others in holding Israel accountable and uh, through things like Amnesty International's report, Human Rights Watch, Betzalem and so on, putting the mirror up and saying this is apartheid, I believe we are doing God's work. We are holding Israel accountable in the hope that they will step back from uh, the the direction in which they are heading, which is one of self-destruction. Thank you. It's good to be reminded that God is a God of love and seeks to forgive and reconcile with his children. Um, We have another question here. Uh, is it necessary to alienate and exclude those who sincerely and perhaps persuasively hold to dispensationalism, but who are just as vigorously against Zionism? Um, theoretically, no, not at all. But I haven't personally met any dispensationalists that were anti-Zionist. Um, in, in my limited experience, they are often the most Zionist of, of, of the Christians I've encountered. Um, and uh, that's that can you know we're all driven by our own experience, but um, yeah, I think it's two 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 separate issues. One is I would want to debate with my dispensational friends. In fact, the guys who helped me become Christian were were dispensationalists, so I was raised on that theology of Hannah Lindsay and Tim LaHaye and so on. Um, um, I'd want to engage with them. Uh, on how they're using scripture and and help them to see that it leads to Zionism today. Because certainly that was the, they were undergirding and underwriting Zionism in the 19th century, emphasizing that God had a separate plan for the Jewish people in the land where the church would be raptured to heaven. So I'd want to deconstruct it at source and show them the consequences of where that theology leads them. Thank you. So in relation to your last point that you shared with us, the last of the five balloons, we have two questions that are somewhat related from different individuals. The first says, so are all Jews saved if they are the true vine that we've been grafted into? And perhaps as a converse, the second question is, or are all Jews lost unless they believe in Jesus? Well, there are two separate questions there. First of all, um, Isaiah 5 does say Israel is the vine. But when Jesus in John 15 said, I am the vine, he's saying, I am the vine and you're not. Or I'm the vine and you're no longer the vine because I'm fulfilling the role that you have, uh, you have failed to fulfill. I am the light to the Gentiles, but God called you to be the light to the Gentiles. So we haven't been grafted into Israel. We've been grafted into the people of God. 
that we because we are abiding in the vine so the one people of god is made up of of, of old testament saints and new testament saints i see the term israel and the church as synonymous not in competition or in conflict um when Jesus said, I will build my church, he says, I will build my ecclesia in Greek. And the word ecclesia is one of the words used for the uh, for the people of God in the Old Testament. So the question comes down to, has God got one people or two? And if we take the Bible literally, um, then we have one people of God on the basis of grace through faith, not law or works. Um, in terms of the second question, um, I, I take very seriously the scriptural passages about God's judgment and, and, uh, and the future day of accountability. Um, and um, I take them very seriously. But at a personal level, an individual level, I never write anyone off. I never judge anyone. Um, I, I pray for them and hope that they will come to a point of repentance before they die um and and therefore i you know i do not give up hope for them um in one of the most enigmatic stories in the gospels uh, when jesus is pronouncing curses on tyre and sidon <clears throat> for example for rejecting him he says it'll be more tolerable on the day of judgment for sodom and gomorrah than it will be for you what he's doing is he's saying if I had gone to Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented and therefore it would be more tolerable for them on the day of judgment than for you. So God not only knows what has happened, he knows what would have happened. And therefore I, I have to hold um, up to him in my prayers, those who at the moment appear to have rejected him. You are muted again, sorry. Sorry, I, need to think, I need to do that again. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Some of uh, what uh, this next question may uh, deal with, you, you may have already dealt with some of what this question, next question is about. But this a person writes, some say that there are two covenants, one to Israel and the other one to Christians or the church. What is your take on that? Can you reiterate a little bit of what you saw, said yeah. this morning and perhaps expand? Yeah, I've said there's only one covenant. Uh, the, the blood of the new covenant replaces the old covenant. Um, the, the new covenant, uh, which Jesus instituted, which the prophets foretold, has replaced the old covenant. The church hasn't replaced Israel. Uh, Jesus has fulfilled the role of Israel. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, there has only ever been one plan and one people of God on the basis of grace through faith for all peoples. Uh, it was called Israel in the Old Testament. They were called Jews, but it was not on the basis of race. So the notion that God has a separate plan for the Jewish people today is something I hope I've explained uh, thoroughly and clearly. Uh, but again, on, on the outline, um, which um, is available on the, on the, I don't know why I'm, I'm <laughs> my picture is blurred um, on the on the leaflet, which you can download, um, is a chart which shows the words used to describe God's people in the Old Testament and the words used to describe God's people in the New Testament. And they're exactly the same words, meaning that God has only ever had one plan, one people, one covenant. Thank you again we may be able to show those uh, uh, slides yes. on during the break time here. Yes, yes. Um, so I have two, once again, two related questions. Um, first is, is replacement theology an accurate description of your analysis? And please comment on the meaning of that term and how one responds to accusations that replacement theology is a manifestation of anti-Semitism. Yeah. And a second uh, person says, are you a supersessionist? Did not supersessionism lead to anti-Semitism? Okay. Um, I may ask you to read the second question. Of course. Moment after I've tried to answer the first one. Um, replacement, the first one theology, replacement theology is a term used by Christian Zionists to critique those of us who deconstruct their theology. 
Um, the church has not replaced Israel. The church is Israel. Jesus has replaced the temple. Uh, Jesus has replaced the high priest. Jesus has replaced the need for sacrifices. Um, the, 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 the gospel is the fulfillment of the promises made uh, through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and, and the prophets and David and so on. So we're into fulfillment theology, not replacement theology. That makes sense. Uh, we're part of the one people of God. It's the fulfillment of the promises God made uh, to Abraham, uh, not the uh, not the replacement of them. The other question I ask my friends, uh, my Zionist friends, is. Uh, does the New Testament teach that the coming of Jesus Christ was the fulfillment or the postponement of God's promises to Abraham? Meaning, uh, was the coming of Jesus plan B? A parenthesis to God's continuing purposes for Israel, and of course it wasn't. That's that's anathema to the New Testament. The coming of Jesus was a fulfillment of the promises. So forget the word replacement. Um, now, true, at times in the past, uh, Christian leaders have um, been antagonistic toward, have persecuted, and have uh, have. Uh, tried to destroy uh, Jewish people, and that's anathema to, uh, you know, anti-Semitism as a form of racism is anathema to, to, to the Bible and should be to all Christians. But it's important that we draw a distinction between um, what the scriptures emphasize about the inclusivity of God's people, in which we welcome uh, all, irrespective of their ethnic background, uh, from, uh, from uh, prejudice that we show to people because of their color or ethnicity uh, you know that is that is should be um anathema to christians uh, there's a, a quote that I, I i make in um zion's christian soldiers which i i'll just read on this because it's important because anti-semitism is uh, is a smear used to try and silence critics of uh, of the apartheid state of israel today um quote <clears throat> this is on page 15 of my book. It's true that at various times in the past, churches and church leaders have tolerated or incited anti-Semitism and even attacks on Jewish people. Racism is a sin and without excuse. Anti-Semitism must be repudiated unequivocally. However, we must not confuse apples and oranges. Anti-Zionism is not the same thing as anti-Semitism, despite attempts to broaden the definition. Criticizing a political system as racist is not racist. Judaism is a religious system. Israel is a sovereign nation. Zionism is a political system. These three are not synonymous. I respect Judaism, repudiate anti-Semitism, encourage interfaith dialogue, and defend Israel's right to exist within borders recognized by the international community and agreed with her neighbors. I favor a one democratic state for all peoples, Jews and Palestinians, um, uh, for those who've been born there, who live there, and those who've been expelled, the right of return. But like many Jews, I disagree with a political system that gives preference to expatriate Jews born elsewhere in the world while denying the same rights to Arab Palestinians born in the country itself. Okay, so let's let's kick out anti-Semitism, but let's not confuse it with critiquing Zionism today. Thank you. Uh, so when you asked me to repeat the second question, though it may be uh, moot at this point because you've already addressed some of this, and that's the question: Is are you a supersessionist? And perhaps you'll need to explain that term. For those of us who haven't necessarily studied theology in the depth that you have, yeah, um, and it does not supersessionism or the, this type of belief that you are presenting here uh, lead to anti-Semitism? Okay, if I take the end of that first, <clears throat> I leave it to, to you and those who've listened to decide whether anything I've said today was anti-Semitic. Um, I don't identify with the word supersessionism. The word super implies uh, supremacism, uh, superiority, and I, I hate that word. Um, the idea is that the church has succeeded 
Israel. And I think I've emphasized enough that God has only had one people. Uh, Israel and the church are synonymous terms. Entry into the people of God in the Hebrew scriptures uh, was on the basis of faith. Abraham was declared righteous before the giving of the law, before circumcision. And, uh, and the same emphasis is in the New Testament. Circumcision is not required. Obedience to the law is not required because we're saved by grace through faith. So supersessionism, like replacement theology, is another term used by uh, Christian Zionists to discredit their critics. Um, and we must repudiate those terms as much as the motive behind them. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so we have a question that may actually be better suited for our next speaker, but since it's asked now, I'll go ahead and forward it on and you can uh, decide to address it or not. Uh, is it true that there are a fair number of Israeli Jews who are joining Zionist evangelical congregations in Israel? Can you repeat that, please? Is it true that there are a fair number of Israeli Jews who are joining Zionist evangelical congregations in Israel? Jews for Jesus, that type of thing. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. So I think Muntha mm -hmm. is better placed uh, to answer that. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll take personal privilege then and ask a question of my own here too. And I'm gonna take you back to your discussion early on about the question of seed versus seeds. Um, I, and I think for myself, I've always wondered, not being a scholar in either Greek or Hebrew, um, whether or not the argument in the New Testament that is made about seed or seeds is one that really holds up in the original languages. Um, uh, seed is often used in, as both plural and singular in the English language at least. And yet it seems that Paul is making a distinction there. Do you want to comment any further? Um, the only comment I'd make is that, yes, um, there, is, there is a scholarly debate as to um, what words mean in Hebrew, what they might have meant um, in Aramaic or um, the language used by Abraham um, at the time. Uh, and what the words <clears throat> what the words would have been understood to mean when uh, the Hebrew scriptures were first written, um, and so there's plenty of scope for speculation, and people write books on it and do their PhDs on it. What matters to me, uh, as someone who believes in the inspiration and authority of scripture, is that when one passage of scripture explains and defines and interprets another passage of scripture. Uh, we must take seriously that interpretation rather than speculate about uh, what it might mean. Um, and so in that sense, when the New Testament takes that very quote, that very promise, and explains its meaning, that's the end of the debate for me, at least. It has been defined, it has been explained, and I have serious problems with a theology that says, no, Christ is not the seed. Uh, it seems to undermine the whole New Testament emphasis, which is that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's purposes on earth. He is the son of God and all the promises from Abraham, uh, sorry, from, from Genesis uh, on were fulfilled in and through him. Um, so I have, I have serious problems with anyone who says that Christ is not the seed. Um, but you saw in that quote from Galatians how Paul plays with the word, says Christ is the seed, but so are you. You are Abraham's seed if you belong to Christ. So he's using it in a plural sense too. But what he's denying is its exclusive use in a racial sense, which was precisely how the Pharisees were using it in the time of Christ. We are Abraham's children, they said. What did Jesus say? If you were Abraham's children, you would listen to me. You are of your father, the devil. So they were using the racial definition of seed. The New Testament emphasizes the spiritual uh, 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 interpretation of that term. And it's in its primary use is to deal, uh, it, it is related to Jesus himself. Thank you. We probably have one time for one other question here at least. Um, and 
for those of us who grew up as I did in, in an evangelical background and grew up at a time when there was a lot of excitement about uh, in 1967 and beyond of, of uh, the Israeli army uh, coming in and, and achieving a connection to Jerusalem, there was a lot of discussion about uh, that we were in the end times and that Jesus' return was uh, imminent. I, I can even remember in my church uh, as a young person, we would uh, do uh, jumping jacks and refer to it as rapture practice. Do you want to try to address the question of whether or not uh, 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 believers will be raptured uh, prior to uh, the return of Christ? Um. The whole is that a subject for a longer yeah, discussion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's one of the elements in the outline, and I hope people will go back and get hold of a copy and read it, because um, the whole rapture theology, along with dispensationalism, is actually teaching the opposite of what the scriptures actually teach. Um, you know, I, when I'm giving these presentations live, I say, hands up if you want to be left behind, and nobody puts their hand up. You know, they don't want to be left behind. And what I show them is that God's will is that you are left behind, that the ones taken are those who've rejected Jesus. Let me just give you one passage. Um, Matthew 24, 37, 39. Jesus says, as in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and what? Took them all away. The ones that were taken were those who did not listen to Noah. Those that were left behind were the ones that were safe in the ark. Jesus says that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Um, the emphasis in the New Testament is that, yes, we will be raptured in the sense that when Christ returns, those that are alive will be caught up to be with him. But there's no, no, no mention of a secret rapture in the scriptures. And it's a rapture um, of, of, of believers. But the emphasis in the New Testament is that it's those who've rejected him who will be taken first. Just give you one example of that. Um, Matthew 13, verse 30. Uh, in, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus insists unbelievers are taken first. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and burn them in bundles, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. You know, if you go to Schofield's reference Bible and his note on that verse, he contradicts what it actually says. He says believers uh, will be taken first. Jesus says, no, it's the unbelievers that are taken first. So I want to be left behind. I want to be safe in the ark. Okay. Stephen, thank you very much for.